If you've ever wondered what it takes to operate a Cardano stake pool, this is the episode for you. Casey Gibson joins me from Ada Ocean Australia and he talks all about what it takes to operate a stake pool effectively. Everything from backups, uh, upgrades and marketing your stake pool and uh, the amount of patience you might need in regards to actually running one too. So make sure you give us a thumbs up, click that subscribe button and hit that notification bell and you'll hear more from us very, very soon. All right, let's get into this. So Casey, thank you for joining me on the podcast. I've been chatting to you on Twitter for a little while now and it's fine to actually meet you semi virtually in, in person. Um, yes. Could you please tell the audience about a little bit about yourself and uh, where you're located? Um, so I'm a full stack developer um, in Brisbane, Australia. Uh, I've been working full time for seven to eight years. Um, started as a multimedia design graduate. I uh, prefer the creative side of computing. Um, I've never been into the sort of um, low level machine stuff. I prefer the higher level creative side of things. Um, always love computers, um, particular hardware, benchmarking, overclocking, uh, custom water cooling. I love being hands-on with the computer as well. Um, still working full time um, uh, while, ta- while maintaining the pool, um, but I'm also currently doing the Cardano Plutus Pioneer program. So right now I've got my hands full. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine. Uh, I've still got to get through all my lectures for that too. So yeah, I've, I've still got a bit to catch up on. <laughs> so how did you get into crypto? What, what, when did you have that spark of interest into, I guess, Bitcoin? And uh, how did you discover Cardano? Uh, yeah, well, Bitcoin was just one of those fascinating things that everyone was getting into. And I thought, well, I could do that as well. So I bought like a cheap $90 ASIC miner, one little tiny little USB ones you just plug in and let it do its thing. And I thought, oh, this is pretty cool, but it doesn't make you any money. Well, this is the time when it was making you nothing. Yeah. Um, so I started getting into the uh, Ethereum mining uh, about the 2017, 2018 mark when it was really starting to boom. Um, had multi GPU set up, water cooling. Um, unfortunately, with the like electricity costs in Australia, that wasn't very profitable for long. But it was enough to pay off a graphics card or two. Um, so I was quite happy with that. Um, I did look a little bit into Cardano, but it never really. Um, at that point, it didn't really take off for me. Um, I looked into being a uh, master node, running a master node for Dash but the, their equivalent of a pledge was way too high compared to what I could afford. So I quickly abandoned that one. Um, so I'd been following Cardano vaguely up until about the Shelley era. And is, is, is that when you decided to start up your stake pool? Yes. Ba- basically, as, as soon as I heard about Shelley, because the uh, when I first heard about the Cardano testnet, they um, only opened it up to organizations that had employees, like, a number of t- people behind it and i didn't really go into it um but once uh shelly came out i'm like oh well, i can actually do this myself so and it's really up my um uh, my skill set in terms of doing because i do full stack development yeah um also i love the hardware um, side of things and trying to optimize um servers and trying to find its bottlenecks and the weak points and all that sort of thing so i love the concept of cardano you don't have to put um millions of dollars into the hardware um it is literally something that anyone if you've got the technical skills could actually do yourself so about when did you start up the state pool then so the shelley era kicked in around when and what what is your state pool actually called um my state pool is called uh, ada ocean australia um i registered that in uh, 19th of august 2020 um, and just to get a little, little bit of a history behind it, um, the first block, I think actually um, registered about 208, the epoch for 208. I uh, didn't get my first epoch, oh, sorry, my first block until epoch 219. Um, and that pulled in a few delegators. Um, but then in, if you're not producing blocks that often, they kind of fell away. And I didn't actually produce my second block until uh, epoch 230. Um, well, you went a actually, bit. 
I waited a bit um, and I'll get to that a little bit later in terms of one of my top tips, but patience is really, yeah. really one of them. Um, but once I got my second block, it was actually just, just before it that the Cardano Foundation had selected my pool to delegate with. Um, and that was when the K parameter was at about the 150 mark. So they had delegated about 64 million ADA, which is That's a lot. quite... It's, it's a lot. I mean, I think to saturate the pool was in the 250, 260 mark. So it wasn't okay. really right at the saturation point, but it was enough to be able to produce probably about 30, 40 blocks in Epoch. Um, so to be able to really prove that the pool itself can produce blocks and run very well. Um, they were still delegating when the K parameter changed to 500 um, and they had adjusted their delegation accordingly. But once they had left, um, had about 316 million ADA, million ADA delegated to the pool. So um, really grateful to the Cardano Foundation in terms of running that program because um, it really helped prove that the pool can run, but also helped to pull in some other delegators. So this, I, I was looking into this on the weekend. Now the Cardano Foundation delegation methodology is different to the IOHK one, isn't it? Is that is that correct? I'm not actually entirely sure with the IOHK one. I've never actually looked into it because I've done the Cardano um, Foundation one which yep. I didn't actually submit anything to. The only requirements was that you had to produce a block and you had to have a certain amount of pledge um, uh, behind it. Um, but since then, I haven't actually looked into any of the other programs that they've been running because I haven't actually needed it. <laughs> yeah, and I don't think you actually fit the requirements anymore because you're way no. over the, um, the, the, the active stake. Um, that's yes. uh, the maximum, so uh, <laughs> hence you haven't looked into it. But I do believe it's um, two separate things, and uh, anyone that's running a state pool should look at both, especially if they're in the early days. Do you know how you actually selected for it? Was it completely random? You met the requirements and they just selected you? Um, I'm not entirely sure because they did change it a few times, but as far as I understood it, it was meant to be random. But I think they may have also been a little bit biased if you had a pool that had a uh, reasonable... Um, purpose behind it. So at that point, I'd had the. Um, um, actually, we're going to talk about this later, I believe, uh, with Ada tools. Um, I actually had that running at that point, and I think that sort of may have drawn their attention a little bit. All right, we'll get into that a little bit later. Now let's dig into your pool a little bit. Now you've got quite a few relays all set up in Australia, and th this is this is a pretty cool setup. Um, I've connected to maybe a couple of them. Uh, creating a little bit of a resource load for you. Could you explain yep. to everyone a little bit how your pool is set up with the relays and uh, the block producers or block okay, producer? Okay, so it's a, yep. So it's a hundred percent Australian base. So all the pools uh, servers are located, located in Australia. Um, so we got um, servers in Sydney, Melbourne, Perth, and Brisbane. Um, all of them have uh, pretty much direct connections to the submarine cable network that goes out to all the other countries in the world. Um, I can actually send you a link to that um, that you can put in um, later. It's actually pretty cool when you look at how many submarine networks are around in the world and where the locations are. Yeah. Um, all of them except Melbourne uh, are very close to those. Melbourne pretty much doesn't have anything near it. It's a bit down the bottom of, of the world. Um, but yeah, so 100% Australian base, um, supporting Australian jobs, which is always going to go down well with people. Um, yep. So yeah, that, that, that's a rough setup that I've got. So the, I've spoken to a lot of other pool operators and that they, they swear that having their uh, block producer, which may be situated in Australia, connected directly to a relay node, maybe in Frankfurt, is the ideal setup so that you have a closer connection to the rest of the network. Is, is that yeah. true? I, I know you've been doing this for a long time and, and I have a feeling you, you, you don't think that's quite right. No. Um, so I wasn't actually part of the test net, um, unfortunately. However, from what I understand that I've been reading, initially um, the first block into a slot was the one that won it, um, which is where the slot battle comes into it. Um, so, but from what I understand and from what I've read, um, 
that has changed because there was all this um, centralization around Europe and USA. So they changed it. So it's going to favor the, uh, the pool that has the lower amount of stake. So having your um, relays in another part of the world purely to try and gain more blocks would be the fastest one. It doesn't actually make sense. And in terms of financial um, means, it doesn't actually make sense even more because there's already people who have, I mean, it, I think last time I looked, there was about 2,000 relays in US and Europe combined. They, ha- they control about half of the network. So you might as well just connect to someone else's relay through your own relay um, because in the end, it doesn't really matter from a technical point of view. Hmm. Yeah, good point. So is having more than one relay uh, more of a benefit in regards to connecting to the network? Um, Absolutely. Um, From a mathematical point of view, um, it does make sense. Um, Because if you have a uh, particular node or relay that can have 25 connections to it and your block sends it to that relay, it can then connect to 25 external relays and propagate it to that. But 25 for me isn't enough. So if you have four (laughs) relays, um, each connecting to 25 external relays, that's 100 um, external relays that your relays are connected to. So, and if those external relays each had 10, just 10 um, connected relays, you've pretty much propagated to half the network and you've almost one jump away from propagating to the entire network. So in my mind, having um, not an insane amount of relays, but your chances of propagating to as many nodes as possible is a lot higher. Yes, I see your point there. Now, what about uh, cloud providers? Uh, Is there a a benefit in regards to using one provider over another? Um, It it depends on what you're actually wanting to do with it, really. I mean, there's a lot of DevOps people out there that um, go for a particular provider. Um, But in terms of um, people starting out, I'd say go with a simple pricing structure. the issue with AWS in particular is that their pricing structure is kind of all over the place and you can get charged for things that you're not even aware of, such as bandwidth. Um, and one of the issues in particular, if you go for a typical EC2 setup, is that the um, not only is the CPU frequency not very high, but also the storage IOPS is not very high. So in terms of card though, the main things that um, you're really looking for um, is the node startup and building the Cardano node from the source code. Um, and those ones in particular are single threaded, what I've noticed. So those would be favored in terms of a higher CPU clock rate. Um, but CT, um, EC2s also have reasonably low IOPS. And from benchmarking, they only have about 3,000 IOPS. And I prefer to have the 10,000 to the 30,000 uh, IOPS range. Um, DigitalOcean, as a comparison, their uh, shared droplets have reasonably high CPU frequencies, but their IOPS are also incredibly high. They're at about the 75,000 mark. And you can go for the premium droplets, which are about 150,000 IOPS, which is way overkill for what we would be using. That's more in terms of if you're using an actual database. Um, but their CPU frequencies, the higher range ones, would benefit a lot more when you're actually starting up your node and you're building it because of that single threadedness. Um, but other um, providers out there like um, Linode and Hetzner, I, I think that's how you pronounce it, it's a German one, Hetzner. Um, but in, for at Ocean Australia, I prefer uh, Linode, mostly because they've got a, um, a technology, I think it's based on Red Hat, um, but it's live migration. So if there's an issue with the underlying server, they can move the virtual machine live to another server without any downtime. And that's the main thing I like about Linode because I've had um, several emails when I started off with it saying that there was an issue with the underlying server, but there's nothing I need to do about it. They successfully migrated. It was more of just a heads up, just to double check everything's running. 
And I logged in. Yep, everything's fine. Didn't even notice it. So I thought that was absolutely brilliant. Um, that is pretty cool, considering that uh, reliability and uptime is one of the key things in regards mm. to you know, running a stake pool. So having that you know, transition from one server environment to another is, is really cool. I had no idea that existed. <laughs> um, the only other one, um, in terms of Australia, uh, Binary Lane, um, they're an Australian uh, base hosting provider. Um, they're actually reasonably cheap. Um, in fact, they're a lot cheaper than DigitalOcean and AWS. Um, and really good um, in terms of configuration. So if you're Australia-based or you want a server in Australia, uh, Binary Lane is really good because they're the ones that I use for the Perth and uh, Melbourne relays. Uh -huh. uh, but they've also got Brisbane and Sydney servers, so they're reasonably spread out across the world, uh, sorry, across Australia. Um, but also uh, for the Brisbane one, I've gone for a good old bare metal uh, server uh -huh. that I've got in, in my home. Just because, why not? Because <laughs> you can, exactly. Yes. <laughs> That's exactly what I did with uh, my setup as well. I've just got the Raspberry Pi just set up in the other room. Just I, I, I've actually, I've actually ordered a Raspberry Pi. I'm keen to see how it will go on it. Yeah, let me let me know what you think. Like, um, I, I think it's going okay. Like, uh, sometimes it kills my router and I have to, like, restart it. But <laughs> in, in regards to, um, you know, just itself operating, it seems okay. It, it mm. takes a little while and a little effort to actually um, compile Cardano uh, on there. But um, once you get it up and running, it's okay. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I have a feeling that it would be the case. However, it, in, in terms of having a, a cheap backup node, I think it's there. Why not use it? Yeah. Oh, I think I've got my other one, which is a backup here. See on the camera. Ah, there you go. <laughs> Just in case something else happens. But yeah, you never know. Yeah. All right. Now, in some other important aspects around managing all of the, the nodes, it's it's the, the maintenance, the updates, uh, and yep. the upgrades for Cardano each time they bring out a new version. So uh, recently we saw 1.226.1 come out, and that was a, a yep. fairly large update. And then we saw the 0.2 come out a couple of weeks after to fix some issues there. How do you go about upgrading your nodes in all these little patch releases that come through? Uh, typically, I'll be very cautious about them unless the um, Cardano dev team actually says this is a priority, you need to get this done as soon as possible because um, I prefer to let other people be guinea pigs for new ones that come out. <laughs> um, so the advantage of having uh, a, a number of relays is that you can update one, let it sit there for a few days, see if it behaves all right, upgrade your next relay and then eventually get around to your block producer. Um, but in terms of actually doing that maintenance, um, as long as you've done your, um, looked up your slot schedule for that epoch and making sure that you're nowhere near, um, well, your downtime that you've calculated is well away from any uh, predicted slots that you might be allocated, um, especially like it, a couple of hours easy because you don't know if you might accidentally break something or you need to rebuild something give yourself a lot of time just in case that uh, little glitch has happened yeah um, but also the underlying server itself as you mentioned with the raspberry pi it can take a long time to build and from what i've seen single as i mentioned earlier single threads seem to pay play a key role in this so if you have a server that has a very high CPU frequency, it typically will um, build a lot quicker. So if you know you're going to be down for a while, so that's, uh, for example, with that last one where we had to do the DB uh, rebuild or rescanning, um, with a lot of these providers, it can charge you for the hourly rate. So you could actually purchase a higher CPU rate for that hour, do your build, and then... When you do your restart, just quickly drop it back down uh, to your lower frequencies, what you were before. So that can help to minimize your downtime. Yeah, cool. That's uh, that's a really good tip. Now, in following on from that, how do you do backups? I know you're Ooh, a big... Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Here we go. I know you <laughs> mentioned this. Absolutely love and... backups. Yeah, like if if an environment fails, you've corrupted something. How do you go about backing up your uh, relays, your block producer, and I, I guess all your keys for your environment as well? What, what's your process there? 
Um, in terms of the block producer and the relay, um, the ones, so I've got a Sydney relay and a block producer relay um, within the same location. Both of those are backed up. Um, the other ones I don't really worry about because if something happens to them, I've got other relays working for you to build it. But the block producer and at least one relay need to have a backup. Um, so if you need to quickly reverse something, let's say you've um, updated a node and it's gone all to pieces, your quickest way might be using that backup that you have. Um, but your other most important thing is obviously your keys. Um, and my policy has always been um, if it doesn't exist in three places, it doesn't exist at all. So if you have your, um, your ADA wallet um, written down, for example, that's only one actual location. You need to have two other ones to play it safe and two physical other locations. Um, and if you have it as a paper backup, put it in a fireproof safe because the last thing you want is when your house is on fire, trying to run around, trying to find that little piece of paper. It's not worth your life. Just put it in a fireproof <laughs> safe. It doesn't have to be a thief proof one, just one of those little portfolio um, uh, case ones. And it's going to be safe when there's a fire, you can just abandon it and know it's all right. Um, you dig so through you, the ashes of your home afterwards trying to find it, but exactly. it should be there. Yeah. Yes. Um, so in terms of, um, other backup um, good to do's is to have an encrypted USB drive because um, this will allow you to be able to uh, put up your put your cold keys onto the encrypted USB drive and then give it to someone or leave it at work and know that no one can actually get to your cold keys. Um, they're reasonably cheap. I mean, about 150 bucks, you can get a reasonably decent one that's approved by the US government. Um, and the good thing with those as well is if you enter the password incorrectly 10 times, it erases itself. So you know that they can't do like a brute force attack or anything like that. Um, but the, also the other added benefit is that um, if you color code it, like put some spray paint on it or something like that, let's say bright red, then you know that that one on there has your cold keys and only to plug it into a um, computer that has never been attached to the internet or is not going to be ever attached to the internet again. So that way, even if you do plug it in accidentally and you decrypt it, oh, I've just exposed everything to the live internet, potentially. Yeah. So if you just color code it, then you know that, okay, this one should only be, ever be plugged into a uh, cold computer effectively. That's pretty useful. That's a good tip too. Thanks for that one. Now I've got some uh, quick fire questions here that were submitted from a couple of users. <laughs> so hopefully you can answer these ones as well and clarify some of their understanding. So we got here. What is chain density? So we can see this appear in maybe G Live, uh, one of the tools that you use to check if your node is up and running. So can you explain what chain density is? Uh, so chain density is basically just a way to measure the health of the network. Um, so you would have seen um, the term of a slot. A slot is just basically one second, and that correlates to an exact moment in time. So if I said uh, we're at slot 100, we've been exactly 100 seconds from the moment the system went live. So chain density is basically a way to actually determine whether a block was actually produced at a particular slot. And typically a slot will be um, allocated to produce a block every 20 seconds. But if you or a pool misses that mark, then you have transactions that are potentially hanging or um, anything else that needs to be processed on the network and the next block has to come and pick it up. So that's where chain density comes into it because it actually gives you a reasonably accurate readout of whether pools are producing their blocks or not. So if you have a 5% chain density, a block should be produced every 20 seconds. And if that chain density falls behind, or sorry, falls below 5%, it means that pools are potentially down or they're not being uh, managed properly and if you really see that number dropping then it could be a sign that maybe there's a, um, a database oh, it's not a database a server uh, location doubt or maybe there's internet problems in general so which is why i'm not really a big fan of all these um, 
people starting up their servers in the US and Germany and all that, because if you have a major outage and all that, then you're going to take a reasonable chunk out of the uptime of Cardano. It's that whole decentralization thing, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so how are these slots allocated? This is another question that was submitted. So you, you spoke briefly about what they were. How are they allocated to the pools so that they can actually start minting blocks? Okay, so as I said, uh, a slot is a one second of time. And what your uh, pool is actually doing in the background is every single slot, so every single second, it's running a function to actually determine whether you have the right to produce a block. And this function will take certain inputs and it will spit out certain outputs. But the main output that you're after is a, and this is a very simplified way of how it actually works. It's a lot more complex. You could go on forums and see how it really technically works. But it spits out a uh, number. And if it's below a certain threshold, then you have the right to produce a block. And the main thing that really affects this number is your active stake that you have for that current epoch. And since this function um, is always going to be consistent, it's based on Haskell, as you would know, it's going to be a pure function. So whatever goes in will always be the exact same result that comes out, uh, which is why uh, about one and a half days before Epoch begins, you can actually calculate um, your entire slot schedule before the Epoch has even started. Because at that point, we already know what the parameters are all this script is really doing is just rapidly going through every single slot and calculating whether your uh, pool has a threshold uh, number below that threshold. Gotcha, gotcha. Now you mentioned there that you can check your, uh, your logs in regards yes. to if you're going to produce blocks in the next epoch. Can you tell our audience how that is done? Uh, I can't remember the script that it was actually called. Um, the one I think I, um, the one I'm currently using is from pool tool, but I have a feeling that may have been deprecated and there's one for CN tools. I think it is, that might be the favored one at the moment. Um, yeah. I did try that and it crashed my block producer. So I haven't actually <laughs> used it again. <laughs> um, but yeah, as I said, basically all it really is doing is recreating what your uh, block producer would be doing throughout the entire epoch, but it's doing it very rapidly, uh, calculating or well, running this function every single slot and just trying to rapidly go through it and see if it meets that threshold and then it can just spit out the result. So it's very handy for state pool operators because then we can do these fancy announce announcements um, before the <laughs> epoch begins saying, oh, we're going to be getting, well, we've been assigned these um, blocks. It doesn't mean we're going to get it, but we've been assigned them. Yes, and hopefully attract some delegates at that point. Yes. Um, yeah, so when, when you know you're going to produce all these blocks, ooh, 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 let's jump on that pool and uh, hopefully get them. But, you know, there's a bit of that delay and lag, so some people don't realize yeah. that. Yeah. Uh, all right, so here's another question that was submitted, and this one's around slot battles, something we mentioned yes. a little bit earlier. You mentioned that uh, um, early in the podcast. What are slot battles? Uh, slot battles is basically when a slot has multiple pools assigned to it to produce a block. Um, so since this uh, function that runs every single second or every single slot is a mathematical equation, there is a chance that another pool will actually be assigned at the same time as you. And that's part of the design of the network. There's nothing wrong with that. In fact, I actually think we should actually have more slot battles because if there is an issue with the uh, one of the pools, then another pool can submit their block with it. Um, but in particular with a slot battle, um, if two pools uh, submit their blocks, it's not whoever submits their blocks the first and propagates the quickest. Uh, that threshold number that I was talking about earlier, what, what like, like I said, this is a very simplified way of looking at it. But basically that number, if it's a lowered number, um, it's the one that is actually chosen to have that block. And as an example, I was looking at um, on the forums of how these actually work and someone was actually analyzing that they had produced a block and it had propagated, but then their relay actually kicked their own block out and chose someone else's. And they were wondering, <laughs> why is this? This is on my own relay. Why is it being kicked out? I was here how first. How dare you portray me? Yes, <laughs> which is a heartbreaking thing to see. <laughs> 
so that's where that um, number comes into it because another block came along and said, no, I've actually got a lower one here. I have more yeah. rights to this slot than you do. Um, and that, one, once again, a, a lower amount of stake actually increases your chances of winning that slot battle. Not guaranteed. I've had pools that are way bigger than me win a slot battle. It's just how luck, luck goes. Mm, interesting. All right. Now, this is a question from another pool operator as well. Now, what happens if you're allocated slots? So you're looking up the leader logs and you see that you've been allocated five slots and mm -hmm. the proc passes and you don't actually produce any. What has happened and how can you work this out? Uh, yes, yeah, so there's a number of, um, as we mentioned, a slot battle could actually have occurred. So in that situation, if you know exactly what slot um, that you are supposed to get it, you can actually look it up to, um, on a Cardano Explorer and try and find if another pool has produced a block during that slot. And if that case, it was a slot battle, there's nothing that you can actually do about it. Um, one of the other things that you might need to look into would be the uh, Kess keys, because they rotate every 90 days. There has been some people who got caught out and forgot to update their um, Kess key. Um, so in that situation, um, it, it might take a while to actually figure out if that is the issue. Um, you've also got other um, node certificates that may be out of sync for some reason, or maybe like, or actually one of the things that I have seen previously is that people update the um, Cardano node and the CLI on their relays and block producers, but then they don't do it on their cold storage server. So they'll be trying mm -hmm. to do these um, updates to their pools, like the Kess key and all that, but they're using an outdated version of Cardano node in the CLI, which can cause issues. Um, but ultimately, um, the Cardano framework has been around for at least six months, ages. So if you're not producing those blocks when you know you should be and you've looked into these um, uh, main problems, Go and look in the forums. There's always going to be someone who's either had the exact same problem or there's yeah. going to be people out there that are willing to try and help you out. Um, or if you've got the, um, if you're using a script to run your pool or if you're using a guide, they typically have like a Telegram channel where the people who actually run it in the same configuration as you can try and give you help along the way. It's, it's somewhat embarrassing for some people to admit that they've uh, missed these slots. It's, um, it, it's one, it, it damages the reputation of the pool slightly, especially it, if you have a can, lot of delegates on there. Yeah, and, it can uh, damage And also it. your skills. Yes, but being honest is also um, more important because if you're missing blocks and you're not owning up to it, then yeah, it, it, it's just not good luck really. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, especially if it's epoch after epoch that you're missing slots uh, and yeah, and not missing especially slots. when you've announced them ahead of time. Yeah, yeah. If definitely. you don't say anything, it's going to act a bit odd. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Good point. Good point. All right. So we've gone through a lot of uh, questions here, and you've explained a lot of things. Let's get to your top five tips for stake pool operators. What are the top yeah. five things you can tell people uh, in regards to operating pool or even starting a pool? Okay, so as I uh, hinted at a little bit earlier, mm -hmm. uh, patience is the main one. Um, mm -hmm. You may not get your first block or even your second block. It, it may take months. Uh, doesn't mean that you're a bad pool operator. It just means that you haven't been lucky enough to actually get something. Uh, my first block, I got it when I had 86,000 uh, ADA delegated to it which is a lot lower number than what people are running at now and still not getting a block. Um, I think my one was, um, and this is when the K parameter was at the 500, oh, sorry, 150 mark. So pool saturation was 260 million ADA. So I was extremely lucky to be able to get those two initial blocks. Um, but be patient with it, keep at it. That's the first tip. Um, Second tip would be uh, m more of a heads up, really. Um, hmm. Be prepared to run your infrastructure for a year with no break even. I was, when I started off, I was fully expecting not to even make 
any blocks for like six months, maybe a year. But I was kind of prepared to stick it out for a year just to say, hey, I tried it. If it failed, it failed. Um, so definitely be prepared. And then you can always take shortcuts with your um, server infrastructure. So you have your uh, block producer and a relay on cloud infrastructure. And as you pointed out earlier, just having like a Raspberry Pi or something at home or something like that as your sort of backup relay. Um, so you can cut corners. I mean, ideally not too many corners. <laughs> yeah. Um, but don't go spending like $500 a month on infrastructure that you're not going to be getting back. I mean, you can if you want. Don't let me stop you. But it's not that um, you don't have to go and do it. Yeah. Um, so that's the second tip. Be prepared to run your infrastructure for a year with no break even. Okay, so marketing would be tip number three. Um, consider why someone would stake or want to stake with your pool. Actually get into the mindset of the delegator and actually figure out why they would actually want to stake with you. Um, that can actually be quite helpful. And you look at these uh, pools that runs on, um, that are based on the memes or they're geeky. Um, they only appeal to those certain types of uh, people. Um, it's not going to be, uh, appealing to everyone so really consider what your pool is actually going to be if you're trying to get the most delegates to it um, and also one thing as well uh, one tip that I got from someone was that don't name your business after your own name because it's very hard to sell it later unless it's like very high end um, so if you if you've created a pool with your own name um, it's not the most professional sort of thing because um, you also got to consider where your pool will be in five or 10 years. Um, you look at Amazon, it, it wasn't named the Jeff Bezos, uh, Bezos what, I think his last name was Jeff Bezos. Yeah. It's not Jeff Bezos company, it's Amazon. Um, so you've got to consider what your pool is going to be like in five to 10 years and start marketing it around that. So yeah. number three, marketing. Uh, a lot of people have found this out. Marketing is a must when you're doing state pool operating. Uh, number four, run it like an actual business. Um, so have a business plan or something that's actually going to be uh, what your pool actually is. And because what, what, one of the things with businesses is that they fail within the first two years of actually going out on a venture. Um, state pool operating is a uh, – Cardano is a literally a billion-dollar framework or system. We need to actually yeah. – take it seriously and treat it like that. Um, so run it, that's tip number four, run it like an actual business. Uh, tip number five, responsibility. So ADA Ocean Australia has 4.2 million ADA delegated to it, which is nearly 5 million US dollars. Uh, I'm not entirely sure what the Australian equivalent is, probably about 6 million uh, Australian dollars. Um, but sport, uh, SBO, uh, sorry, SBOs are responsible for all the delegators' 5% yearly return on ADA. As in, if you're running a pool, you are personally responsible for getting the interest on someone else's money. And just to put that into perspective, um, ADA Ocean Australia at this point has uh, returned uh, about 300,000 US dollars in rewards. Now, when you think about it that way, that's $300,000 of people's actual money. So you do need to take some responsibility in running your pool and running it the best that you can because you are literally helping other people have a better life with their money. So those are my five top tips. Um, patience, be prepared to run your infrastructure for a year, marketing, run it like an actual business and responsibility. Casey, that was absolutely fantastic. I, I really hope everyone's <laughs> taking notes and uh, has written all that down and has really taken on board. That's uh, absolutely fantastic. Thank you so much for that. That's all right. Now, last but not least, you mentioned a little bit earlier the little project that you're working on, which isn't that little. It's quite big now. And I've found <laughs> myself staring at this hologram on your website for many, many hours. I've taken screenshots and posted it all over the place. <laughs> Adatools.io. Can you tell the audience a little bit about this, why you created it, what's it for, and uh, how can people use it? Yeah, so initially I, I wanted to create something that um, I thought 
would be very beneficial to everyone in terms of Cardano. Um, there was already um, tools out there, but they're very um, orientated towards pool analyzing. I wanted a multi-tool for Cardano. And I, I really, like I was mentioned earlier, I really like the creative side of being a full stack developer. So the first thing I thought of, well, how can you actually visualize the decentralization of Cardano? Um, so that's where I decided to come. The, the first actual project was the hologram. It was its own standard ah, product. It was just a website with just the hologram. And people absolutely loved it, which is an amazing thing to have when people really like your own um, yeah. creation. Um, so that then shifted onto the actual um, adatools.io in terms of its full Cardano dashboard and slash explorer and um since then i've added the news section uh pools twitter feeds i thought that was a useful thing to see how active people's tool uh twitter feeds were um real-time block analyzer um it's not the greatest out there uh pool.pm i think they are um they've got an absolutely fantastic uh real-time uh explorer so check them out um but the uh, I don't know if anyone actually noticed it yet. I don't know if you found it yet. But the homepage has a Easter egg hidden on it. Um, oh, interesting. So I hid that on there a while ago. I thought, oh, this is a nice little thing just to dump on there. Um, and All then there's right. other aspects. There's other aspects. It's, it's just a little thing. It's nothing amazing. But I thought this was pretty cool. Is it um, pretty yeah. obvious once you find it? Um. I'll give you a hint. It says time waster on it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. When you see time waster, you'll know what it is. Okay. Fantastic. Um, I, I'm, I'm going to see if any of the uh, audience listeners and uh, viewers can actually find it. <laughs> I did actually put a tweet out a couple of months ago, or maybe two months ago, saying if anyone actually spots it. A number of people did actually find it, um, but I think the... Uh, low number of replies meant they didn't find it. <laughs> so <laughs> some people find it, some people don't. Um, okay, interesting. But yeah, so in terms of the um, the only other thing I really added, I thought would be beneficial would be a, a pool health checker. It's not, it hasn't got every single uh, thing in there to actually determine whether your pool is running healthy, but it does your basic things like determining whether your um, certificate hashes match up. Um, it'll see if your relays are online. Um, and it also connects to the uh, Cardano Smash server, which is uh, the one they use in their wallet to determine pool ranking. But it can actually determine if it finds any errors with your pool. So um, that was a good thing that I was able to sneak in before the Cardano Plutus program started because I really wanted to get that one in uh, <laughs> before then because I'm really busy with that at the moment. Uh, yep. but there's also a testnet version of adatools.io um, because at the time when I put it up, there was no other tool out there for testnet people to actually see what's actually happening. Um, so I put that one up there for them. Um, and just putting it out there, if you run a pool, uh, please create a testnet. Um, yeah, it's very beneficial because currently their chain density is quite low. I think it was around 3% last time I looked at it. Ooh. Might be rising a little bit. Um, obviously... I don't know how they deal with hundreds of people signing up to it because they've only got limited ADA. But if you are able to have the opportunity to um, create a test net, then definitely do that. Yeah, I remember when signing up to the test net, they, um, they, they've got the faucet so you can withdraw ADA to your uh, test wallet. But then they ask once you decommission it to send it back. Yes. I have a feeling a lot of people don't send it back. <laughs> well, it's actually interesting because when I actually released the ADA tools, um, on the test net, there was a number of people actually saw it and they realized that they hadn't actually deregistered their pool. So there's uh -huh. actually a lot of go uh, ghost pools on there um, that are producing any blocks because it hasn't been maintained. And a lot of them have deleted their cold keys, so they can't physically return it. So that's a bit of an awkward one. <laughs> yes, yes, a little bit. I, I, pr I should probably check mine to see if I have. <laughs> <laughs> I believe I have. But anyway. All right. Casey, this has been absolutely fantastic. It, you're a wealth of information and I will definitely have you back on the podcast <laughs> uh, to pinch a little bit more out of your brain and uh, and learn a little bit more. So thank you so much. Um, That's all right. I ho hope to help. <laughs> <laughs> it definitely has. How can people find you and your pool? 
Um, so uh, Twitter, we've got Ada Ocean Australia on there. Um, that's the main way to find it or um, adaocean.com.au. That's what our website is. Um, if you want to contact me at all, then Twitter is probably a uh, direct message or a tweet is probably the easiest way to get through to me. Um, but yeah, on the website, there's other ways you can contact me if you want to like Telegram or anything like that. Great. Fantastic. I think I, I first contacted you via Twitter and you're quite quick to respond. So <laughs> uh, if anyone else wants to bug Casey for any sort of information in regards to pool ops, <laughs> I'm sure you can flood his uh, Twitter inbox. Oh, this is going to be interesting. <laughs> <laughs> awesome, Casey. Thank you so much for joining me on the podcast. This has been awesome. absolutely fantastic. Th thank you for having me. I mean, I, I, I've listened to a few of your previous comp, uh, podcasts and it, uh, you've done a great job. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Casey. Thank you so much for staying all the way to the end and listening to that entire interview. If you have any questions for Casey, please leave a comment in the video and I'll get Casey to reply back to them as soon as possible. Now, again, if you like the video, make sure you hit that thumbs up, click that subscribe and click that notification bell and you'll get more videos from us soon. All right. Until next time, guys. See ya.